And Jesus Christ was a superstar We were singing day by day Jesus Christ, he's the only way Hands raised and my voice on high I was praising Jesus for my new life And I'll never forget your love The night you set me free Baptized in the river at night With my eyes and I saw the light We were preaching everywhere That Jesus Christ our sins he did bear Hands raised and my voice on high I was praising Jesus for my new life And I'll never forget your love The night you set me in the midst of the turbulent 1960s and the early 1970s, a religious revival occurred amongst young people, especially hippies, college students, and the counterculture. This revival was called the Jesus Movement. This youth revival was concurrent with what became better known as the Charismatic Movement, a Pentecostal revival among mainline churches, starting with the Roman Catholic Church and reaching traditional evangelical churches. The youth revival that occurred had no one particular personality or leader spread like wildfire in the formation of Christian communities as these young people voraciously read the Bible, the Acts of the Apostles in the New Testament, various Christian communities ranging from Christian communes to intentional communities of like-minded people living in close proximity to one another to live out the gospel and the teachings of Jesus began forming. In the Midwest, a professor of civil engineering at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, Dr. David Hatcher, recently baptized with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, began forming essentially a New Testament-style church, a Christian community they called Dayspring Community. This is their story. people as Dave. My father was Merrill Hatcher and uh, <clears throat> I was born when he was in seminary at William Jewell College in Liberty, Missouri. I was the third child born while he was in seminary. The earliest memory I have was we lived in a very small house across the street from my grandmother. I remember that he was teaching school somewhere out in the country and uh, <clears throat> then he lived in a tent through the winter and he had me there one for some brief of time period of time with him in the tent and I was freezing uh, my sister's started first grade in the little town in which my grandmother lived and they started first grade well they were a year apart they started school together and um, my mother always dressed them alike because she was not going to have any partiality uh, I started school in Fulton, Missouri when I was not, not yet six. I was five. My, November, my birthday was in November. We'd been raised in the Baptist church, gone to sleep in pews in the Baptist church when everybody else had left the auditorium, uh, had marbles clatter down the steps of the balcony. <laughs> and, and I just didn't pay any attention. My two sisters, however, had responded to a call for salvation. And, uh, a friend invited me to go to, to a, an independent Baptist church in 
Laramie. And I went. And they had a, a very young evangelist. And, you know, my heart responded to what he was saying. But I was too shy to respond to the invitation. I just sat in my chair. I reacted to the, the legalism of the church, and eventually I left. I went to college. Knowing that I was a Christian, I stopped going to the Baptist church when I started at college. I, I went to the University of Wyoming and uh, basically lived my life as not a Christian. Young man from I don't know where. He was passing through, he was speaking, and he began talking about the Lordship of Jesus. Now, I'd been exposed to Baptist Church since I was an infant. I had never heard. Now, it doesn't mean that it was not spoken, but I never heard anything about the Lordship of Jesus. So I decided that's the way I wanted to live my life, under his Lordship. I know that I was definitely a secessionist at the time. Um, one of our, one of Ruth's friends, who became my friend, who was, um, he had some kind of a nerve disease. He spoke with difficulty. He had, he had a girlfriend in Colorado whom he'd been to see, and he came back and she said she was filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. And I said, Leroy, that's not from God. So I'm at San Jose State, and I was asked to speak at an intervarsity meeting. As shy as I was, I, I, I wasn't able to keep secret that I was a believer. And uh, so that made the connection with the university on campus and we had a lot of a lot of students coming to our home and one of them was i believe a presbyterian and he talked about the holy spirit being poured out in their church hmm. And then I came across of a magazine which was published at the time, but no longer is, which had an article about the Holy Spirit boring, being poured out upon the InterVarsity group at Yale University. Oh. So. We moved to St. Louis, to Washington University. And uh, I taught a college-age Sunday school class at Memorial Presbyterian Church. It was well received. Many students coming, not all of them from WashU or other colleges, some who were just un unattached career people, young people. And uh, began hearing about the uh, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. One of, one of the older men, he was an engineer at, at McDonald at the time, was, was, came to dinner to our house and he said, Yeah, I, I speak in tongues every day. So eventually someone invited us to go to the meetings 
at Visitation Academy. And so in the early 70s, Charismatic Renewal was beginning in St. Louis, and so somebody said, a woman who was an older sister of a friend of mine kept calling me up and says, Eddie, you've got to go out to Visitation where there's having this wonderful new Pentecostal Charismatic Renewal. The person who influenced the renewal of Father Francis McNutt, who was a Dominican in those years, and he began to see the fire of the Spirit and began to realize uh, as it hit the Catholic Church in 1967, it was called the Duquesne Weekend. Back at Notre Dame, Catholic priests, nuns, and lay leaders attended the renewal meetings while on campus for continuing education. When they went home, they took this with them. They went all over the United States, they went to Australia, they went to the Philippines, they went to various countries in Europe. So I can remember one night being in that room and hearing a prophecy that I remember this way, fire, fire, fire spreading from east to west. And uh, I was eager to go. I was, I was. desperately hungry. So, there were, there were three very well-known charismatics, their leaders nationwide that night, and uh, I don't remember the names. Well, Francis McNutt was part of that. Well, Frank, Francis McNutt was the leader of that mm -hmm. group. Right. Uh, but often he was not there because he was right. traveling so much. Um, but anyway, they, you know, they were sharing, talking. So, and the meeting went on quite a while, and uh, they. How do how do I get it? How do I? Well, Carl, the man, had said he spoke in tongues. He said, "Well, it's simple. Just kneel down and ask the Lord and to to." baptize you with the Holy Spirit, and then just start speaking in tongues. Well, I tried that. Ah, didn't work. Well, so when finally an invitation was given, anyone who would like to receive the Holy Spirit go to that room, and uh, Bob McKee will pray for you. So I was there with about 20 people, probably three-fourths of them young priests. And so they started at the other end of the line, and, and I could hear what was going on here. Some spoke in tongues, some didn't. But and finally got to me, and he laid hands on me, asked Jesus to baptize me in the Holy Spirit, and he said, then just be, start making sounds. And I did, and it, it became an eloquent language. And I sang in the Spirit, and the Lord showed me that I had been a man who was a role player. I was one man at church, and I was another person with the students and I was another person with my family, and that person was not very nice. So, it was over. That was, it, it had begun, let's say, put, put it that way. Now, Ruth, all of this time when I'd say, oh, no, it's not from God, she would say, Nani, huh? Hey, don't. Don't be too quick to judge. She had gone to Pentecostal camp meetings in Wichita. So we called someone who came and ministered to her, and she was baptized in the Spirit. And uh, those meetings, they were small, maybe 12, 15 people at the most. There were two teachers there who were just bubbling over. They, every week they came with a new story about how the Lord used them with their students or with fellow teachers and just 
irrepressible. And the meeting was moved to our house. Why so long? You know, this has nothing to do with me. It has to do with the Lord. Um, Ruth and I went on our usual summer trip. We had some experience with gifts of the Spirit that we they were new to us. Gift of knowledge in which the Lord showed me something about a woman which was later a person, Ruth old calf actually, in Norton. What I said, and she said, oh, how did he know that? I've been ministering to her about that. So we wanted to serve God in whatever way he wanted. We were willing to sell our house. We were came back that fall. My dean asked me to be the chairman of the department. I said, well, I have a life that you don't know anything about. I I shared with him what had been happening, and he he was a man who was completely unchurched, knew nothing but whatever he had heard about Christianity, and he said, "Well, don't you, don't you think you could do more good if you just stayed with engineering and helped people that way?" That, well, no, I think I need to resign. He said, don't resign. Take a leave of absence. So you, the door is open for you to return. So, we did. Took a half time leave after this. Now it was during that summer, I believe, that Barbara Ann Chase came to St. Louis. Barbara Ann Chase was a nun in a convent in the Seattle area. She had been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And she had met Rodney Lynch, who was a Lutheran pastor who had moved to St. Louis, having been baptized in the Holy Spirit in his Lutheran church in Thousand Oaks, California. And uh, we had gotten to know him very well. So she called Rodney Lynch and she said, um, the Lord wants me to come to St. Louis. I have a message for the church. Oh, come ahead. And he, when she was to arrive, he called me and he said, you know, it's just not convenient for me to pick her up. Uh, could you pick her up? And uh, so I did pick her up. It wasn't hard to tell because she was a nun and she had a habit, you know. <laughs> the good one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so she came home and she stayed with us the whole summer. An encourager, completely an encourager. You know, David, you can, you know, you need to be not an agger. You know, she, she no. just. And uh, during that summer, we had made connections with some Lutheran high school students from a town in Iowa who were ministering at an inner city Lutheran church. And, and there, they said practically the whole town they came from had been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Um, so we made connections with them. They 
They came to the house several times, and then they left. Now, in the meantime, my cousin John Albert Hatcher had uh, He stayed in her house while we were gone. Now, he had become a Christian at Umsel, where he was a student. His, his family still lived in Long Island. His father, a Pan American captain. Before Dayspring actually existed, I had been living with David and Ruth, and uh, they. Uh, I had met the Lord by then. I'd actually met the Lord in a Lutheran church that I was going to. Had not experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit yet, but I was a believer. Uh, I was staying with them, and they were going on vacation, so I was house-sitting for them. We had a, a pamphlet there, How to Receive the Holy Spirit. We didn't leave it there for John. We didn't leave it there for any particular reason. We just didn't take it with us. He saw it. He said, oh, okay, he followed the steps. He was filled with the Spirit, speaking in tongues when we got home. He was just... It's a small pamphlet by the St. Louis area Lutheran pastor, Rod Lynch, who had himself experienced the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and this pamphlet was his story about it and his explanation of the, uh, of the baptism did indeed experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was quite exciting. David and Ruth were excited when, uh, when they got back to find out that that had happened. Um, my not yet wife, Judy, was a little less excited at the time because she thought, oh great, <laughs> we'd been dating and now I'm turning into a religious fanatic. So that caused a little disturbance uh, for a while. I grew up uh, loving Jesus. I didn't realize that I could have a personal relationship with him. We met together just in the living room there at David and Ruth. It was very casual. I was somewhat suspect of this baptism in the Holy Spirit thing. So I was hesitant, but as we began to worship and pray together, it just happened. And I accepted that. And it was, it was like I said, life altering. And so he lived with us, and, and he was at the time a student at UMSL. And for those of you who don't know what UMSL is, it's the Uni University of Missouri at St. Louis. And had many friends there. Uh, Evan Dodd was a student there. Uh, John Albert had gotten involved in InterVarsity. Evan was. So they knew each other. David at the time was uh, the faculty advisor for InterVarsity Christian Fellowship at Washington University and had introduced me to some people who were at uh, University of Missouri St. Louis, UMSL, the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship group there. Uh, among those people were Evan Dodd. And uh, we had uh, a couple of meetings actually at David and Ruth's house uh, after I had met the Lord and after I had the baptism of the Holy Spirit um, with some of the, primarily the Washington U kids. And uh, so that was kind of, these were, there were some meetings that were sort of proto Dayspring before Dayspring really existed. And then uh, Judy, uh, my future wife, met the Lord, and, uh, and then also, this is about uh, 1969, when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, met the Lord in 68, baptized, baptized in the Holy Spirit in 69. And then uh, we had, there was a meeting at David and Ruth's house, and it was, uh, I would have to say it was the beginning, really, the first meeting of what was to become Dayspring. And it was David and Ruth, Judy and me, and Barbara and Chase. And now we're into 1970. Judy had met the Lord and at this time in 1970. And the, to be in that kind of fellowship that grew out of loving each other, 
that was the center of it. I We're still not really, haven't, we hadn't been named Day Spring. That particular meeting with the, with the uh, five of us there was the time when Judy received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And the Lord brought me to a particular scripture, and I don't want to share it right now, but it, was, it took me out of the church that I was then established in because I realized that that was not something that I b believed. That I read in that scripture that contradicted a doctrine of that church. Subsequent to that, there were some other meetings, and we, we, a prayer meeting began on, on Wednesday night. And uh, friends of ours came. There were different people that David and Ruth knew came. And that was indeed the beginning of Dayspring. Uh, we sort of, uh, there were a lot of college students, uh, friends of ours. Uh, we were kind of arranged in, in, uh, in households. The person who <clears throat> was most influential in John's, uh, I, I call him John Albert because we have so many Johns and John Hatchers in our family. John Albert uh, had a political science professor who befriended him and, and really was instrumental in his coming to Jesus. Day Spring for me was uh, preschool basically, infancy maybe, before that. David is my first cousin, so we have that relationship. But more significantly, David and Ruth were my spiritual parents. Um, I was raised nominally Christian, but didn't really know Jesus. I met Jesus under their encouragement and teaching. So John Albert began inviting people to come to our house to hear about the Holy Spirit. And so that was going on, as well as the, the meeting the, the Lutheran students. At the end of the summer, we said, well, now what? And Barbara Ann was still living with us. And so she said, well, what? Just keep on meeting. So we did. Um, Ed Stites was a young man who was a Catholic, from a strong Catholic family who had been baptized in the Holy Spirit. We somehow made connections with him, I don't remember how. I started attending um, uh, the Bible study at Dave and Ruth's house in uh, early 1971, and um, I think the worship and the, the study time was uh, particularly, um, had a particular effect on, uh, on us as we came in and we worshiped and waited on the Lord. Um, he dropped by one day wondered if we could loan him some money because uh, he needed gas money to get to his class. He was going to the, the, the school, the teacher's college downtown. And uh, his sisters were baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they moved to University City to be close to us. My uh, sisters, I started talking to Georgie and Jackie about um, what was going on in Dayspring, and uh, eventually uh, Georgine and uh, Jackie both started coming to the prayer meetings at, at Dave and Ruth's house. As other people began to do. And we had then a second meeting and then a third meeting in her home. Um, it was a chaotic neighborhood because you can imagine all these people coming and taking up parking places for several blocks. Uh, various ones of us had uh, people staying with us, and uh, we weren't yet calling them households, but that's really what was forming. 
And uh, that was really the, uh, the beginning of Dayspring. Uh, we were involved, some of us in, in other groups around the St. Louis area. And uh, <clears throat> we were visiting, I was visiting across the river in Edwardsville, Illinois, with uh, the uh, really a, a Christian commune that had been formed through Gary Bridges and his wife uh, led that. All, all we, in our ignorance, uh, let me, we were really unaware of what was happening on the street. What we felt, but what we knew, is that we, was, we were doing what the Lord wanted us to do. And uh, so it, it grew more people coming. Who are we? What are we? Where are we headed? Graham Pokingham was the rector of the Church of the Redeemer in Houston, Texas, and and he had some supernatural stories to tell. He said when he was, he, well, I won't tell his story, but God was obviously at work. That a vision of what the church could be if the people who were members of the church were really bound together in a deep commitment of love and faith to be servants in the world. And I could see that in order for this church to have any, any success whatever in this neighborhood, it was going to have to be peopled by um, members whose commitment was, first of all, to being servants of Christ. I don't mean ordained people. First of all, servants of Christ. Not that they would not have jobs, not that they would not earn their own way, not that they would not live in the secular world, but that primarily they were committed to being servants of Jesus Christ together. And they began to have community. And he, he talked about community, people living together, close together, relating to one another. About half the total membership of this church formed the Redeemer Fellowship, a nucleus of God-oriented people who live and minister together in Christian houses and share a unique closeness. Everything they do, everything they have, they believe, comes to them from God. What's going on inside? Mimi Armstrong, who sings her faith to visitors at a coffee house ministry, claims the Holy Spirit gives her her song. Now Graham and Betty Jane Pokingham share this large and lovely home in an integrated neighborhood with a family much larger than their own. My husband and I and our six children live in this household and uh, a friend of ours, Virginia Withy, and her four children live here with us. Another friend, Mary McCracken, and her daughter live with us. Another teenage girl lives here whose family lives in this neighborhood and and that should add up to 18 people. We don't assume that only the down and out people need to know that God is very much alive. There's not a certain label whereby you have to be a missionary in some foreign country to be doing the will of God, to be living his life. And the house that I live in is a household of six young women. Jeff Cuthran, who manages the bookstore boutique, came from South Carolina to join the Redeemer community. I, I work in the Jeff lives with other young men in a household near the university. A number of people who have come into contact with the fellowship since and are, are hoping to be able to move in. We have a, a desire to, oh, to, to influence the church at large. With all of the sounds of renewal. So that's what was happening with us without any intention on our part to do that. Um, music. We weren't singing because I didn't want to sing badly. We had no one who could play an instrument. And then there, there was a couple from California who were good friends of Ruth and Bob McKee, they told him about our meeting. They came. She exhorted me afterwards. She said, you need to be singing. Oh, okay. 
And very shortly after that, Fritz Klein started coming. I have no idea how he heard about it. I was a Lutheran, and I found a Lutheran pastor in St. Louis after I left the seminary who was having prayer meetings, but they were mostly older folks at the time. And so he told me about Dave Hatcher and the young people's group that was meeting in his home. So I thought I'd try it out, and I liked it. At some point, I think I mentioned that I played guitar and uh, Dave asked me if I would be willing to help with worship. And uh, so uh, that began an odyssey of not only regular commitment, because now I was doing that, but uh, a more deep involvement with um, the Hatchers and the different people that were meeting in their house. But we don't know how a lot of things that God does happen. And Fritz was a musician. So he had gone with us to a conference in Oklahoma City. And I said, Fritz, would you be willing to lead music for us? Not about it. He said, yes. He said, the Lord told me to put down my guitar sometime, but I think I'm free to pick it up again. At some point, um, he asked me if I would uh, be interested in living with them. And uh, I think it was because we'd been robbed at the place that I was living at the time and it wasn't safe or something. I had no place to go. That might have been it, or maybe it's just because I, I was needy. But whatever the case, I moved in and lived with them for probably a year or more. And uh, during that time, all kinds of things were going on in the fellowship, but uh, the, the Hatchers, David and Ruth, were um, like surrogate parents, in a sense. I, I watched how he fathered his sons and loved his wife, and um, I think in particular the, the fathering of, of his boys, Bill and John, uh, really, really ministered to me. And uh, so we, we developed a, a friendship and a, a close relationship, and um, um, I began to be part of leading the group, not just in worship, but in other ways. And uh, it was a very meaningful period in my life. That relationship was one of the most significant of my Christian friendships. And so music became almost our identification. One of the things that several of us would do during the summer is to go out to Don Wiegand's family's grocery store, and then Don Wiegand had a art studio. And we would go over to the art studio, and we'd sit around and sing Christian songs, play the guitar, and other instruments started to emerge and as a group we just spent time praising God and before we knew it it was on Friday night and people started showing up and we didn't know where they were coming from or why they were coming or but anyway after a while we moved together into a group and we created a stage area and began to put the songs into sets of about five with people sharing in between songs sharing what god was doing in our lives and sharing um, uh, just things that jesus was teaching us through scripture and that's how the coffee house began it just kept growing until on Thanksgiving of that same year, 1971, it turned out that 
probably 100, 125 people showed up on one Friday night, on the Friday night after Thanksgiving, and we were stunned. But that was the growth of the coffee house and the community. visitation but you just get back in the groove as soon as you see people because there's a huge bond of love. Well day spring sprung out of quite literally it, it devolved it, it bloomed from a series of prayer meetings of college uh, age young people and some older and it became a committed fellowship of people that really had no idea where we were going but had a, a vision that was something similar to what was going on at the Church of the Redeemer in Houston where people wanted to see God work in their midst and, and one of the ways that it seemed to be happening was in close proximity to one another. And so we began to be interested in um, developing households where single young people would uh, move in with other young people uh, of the same sex <laughs> in those days. And, uh, uh, and, and we sought to minister to folks in ways that, and to one another, in ways that could only be done by living together. Um, around the dinner table on a regular basis and you know, how was your day and how, how, how did you deal with the things that we talked about this morning. And so that daily kind of ministry that was going on um, and, and many of us uh, I think received the same kind of nurturing from, from the Hatchers. Uh, as, as parent figures we, we learned how to uh, grow in ways that maybe we hadn't before. So and Day Spring became a, a very real community of people that loved one another deeply and were committed to um, whatever it was that God had, and uh, it was a unique, uh, a unique thing. Um, and we we developed households, some of which had married couples with a few singles living with them. Most of them were single folks that had uh, maybe one individual. Uh, that had particular needs, um, living with others that didn't have that kind of need, and and so um, it was uh, uh, a growing, exciting thing. And uh, we we took our meals often together. We ran back and forth across the street in our little clusters of communities, sharing this, that, and and uh, um, and we began meeting in other people's homes and and. Uh, it, it was a, a wonderful fellowship. It was growing. It was getting closer to God. It was learning to read scripture. It was sharing time with each other, sharing time in prayer, 
And besides the coffee house, we had a Wednesday night prayer meeting at David and Ruth Hatcher's. And from there, a community began to grow up. Um, I went to Houston, Texas. There was a Christian community there. I spent time, a weekend, and I came back with this vision of living in community. I shared that in the Wednesday prayer meeting. Hetty and Johns came up to me immediately after the prayer meeting and said, I'm interested. Can we look for a place together? And absolutely, I was in. My sister Jarjean was in, and the three of us um, rented a, an apartment not too far from the Hatcher's house, and that was the first community house. I think also the relationships that we were in a community. And at one point, we, when we lived on Tulane, there were three or four other households all within, you know, uh, a few buildings of each other and young married couples and um, we all shared our resources with each other. At one point, um, we uh, needed gas and we went to uh, our friends and asked them, you know, do you have any money, can we? And uh, they said, sure, you know, and then when we had excess, uh, we would uh, give to, uh, to others and there was just a, no sense of uh, really needing to pay back but to be available to share our lives together and that focus has uh, remained and that was something that Dayspring really promoted and that we really appreciated and benefited from that we learned about laying down our lives for one another. When we began our married life living in the community, uh, Day Spring community, um, at times people would pass through uh, the community and uh, the, we would take people in. And so we had an extra bedroom. And at one point we had somebody come and um, stay with us. And uh, he, um, we did, only had uh, limited funds and we were running out of food and so uh, Gail put uh, the two turkey breasts we had in the oven and uh, we just figured, okay, well, Lord, we'll just have to f split this up three ways and, and uh, stretch the rest of the food. And um, so she kind of came in to where I was and mentioned, you know, we only have two, so we're gonna you know, share that. And um, uh, so at, uh, when she went back in and began putting all the, the food on the table, as she pulled out the uh, chicken breasts, um, there ended up being three in the pan. And we uh, have no, we call that the miraculous chicken. And uh, we have no idea how that third chicken uh, was supplied, but we uh, definitely gave thanks for that. My first family, I think, day spring mm -hmm. was. My family life uh, didn't give me a lot of what I needed to be an adult. And Day Spring helped me see what that would look like. It was wonderful to be part of Day Spring, be part of a family, to, to have a place where I could worship and not be judged, yeah. to be cared for, that things would show up at our house unannounced. Things now, you know, food and money and stuff would show up unannounced and it was and then we also had the opportunity to get that back yes see and and we were encouraged to do that and it helped me because my family wasn't like that my family didn't give stuff to other people so that's what day stream was for me it was a family mm -hmm. and you guys in a very practical way were mom and dad to me at a time when i really needed that i needed somebody to tell me this is just life valerie you're not gonna die <laughs> They're willing to act as a, a oversized, if you want, or good, expanded, extended family. That they all supported each other and they all had the uh, interest of each other at the center. And they formed an interesting group. Hmm. They cared. 
Mm -hmm. Particularly in the fact that we've done in this, uh, what, 70s, the late 70s when we were all becoming uh, twilight of this and twilight of that and everything was ending, it seemed to be a very strong group. Mm -hmm. They kept themselves together. Uh, David was a good teacher and uh, I liked his Bible studies. I don't know, they were like a mom and dad, spiritual. They were a big influence. The incubator for a lot of babies who spiritual babies, spiritual babies who yeah. the Lord used Day Spring to um, bring to maturity and send out into the world to launch us off. And Dave and Ruth is kind of our <laughs> spiritual parents who pushed us out of the nest. <laughs> taught, taught us well, and um, it's. It's affected our lives ever since. Dave's counseling was amazing. You know, we could call him up and he would sit for hours and talk to us and coach us and guide us on his experience. Ruth did the same thing. She was blessed to have David and Ruth Hatcher in our lives. And I can say that for myself and probably a hundred other people. That to this day, none of us will forget. And to this day, when we bump into some, one of us that we're in that, in quote, Dayspring community, um, we're still related. It's like we, we came blood brothers and sisters. So I, we owe that, to, that wonderful experience to those two wonderful people. Day Spring saved my life, saved my marriage. Um, if it hadn't been for Evan Dodd pestering us at Forest Park Community College on the switchboard and getting my husband to come to one of those crazy meetings at Dave and Rue's house, we probably would not be married and have all the children that we have today because I was about ready to leave him and things were not going well for the Galloway family. But Dayspring taught me what it means to have a mother and father that cared about us and that's what Dave and Ruth were, were spiritual mom and dads that just put in countless hours and just helped us through that time in our life. Uh, Dayspring taught us community. We never knew what it was like to have people living in our home. And Dayspring to me was, um, well, first of all, it was the introduction to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which just totally turned my life around. I, I grew up with epilepsy, and not, not many people knew that. And. Um, Dayspring was like a new start, sort of. Uh, people didn't know that I had epilepsy, but they didn't care, you know. And um, for people who don't have epilepsy, it's just an illness. For the people that do, it's a stigma. And uh, you, I don't care what the situation, you always feel less than. Hmm. And um, I didn't feel that way in Day Spring. I was accepted for who I was, and it it made me able to just be who I wanted, who who God wanted me to be, mm -hmm. and just express myself and be myself, and just enjoy being with people who I knew loved me. It was it was an introduction to worship that I never experienced anywhere else that even though we you know we've been dispersed as a community for a while that still god we took the fruit of what came of our life together we to wherever we went whatever next thing in in whatever way that god worked it through us day spring was the place where the lord deepened personalized and solidified my faith, where I made friendships for life and for wife, and I uh, am thankful for the, that time period that the Lord used in my life. Because we have the, the common experience of knowing Jesus as our Savior and I think Dayspring was one of the first places where I felt totally accepted 
and I felt like people really wanted to be my friend and that that was a that's just something that meant a lot to me for all of my life. I attended uh, Harris Stowe Teachers College uh, my freshman year and uh, met with a group of friends at um, lunchtime each day and uh, one of the people uh, I got to know was Linda Marshner. Well, I first heard about Dayspring when I was in college. Uh, I met a young man named Ed Stites. We were going to Harris Teachers College and uh, he, like me, had been raised Catholic, both in large families. And I invited her to come to Dave and Ruth Hatcher's house for a prayer meeting and worship, and she started coming. And I always took God seriously, but my, my um, understanding was very limited. And he talked about the Lord as though God still spoke to him now. That was a brand new concept for me. I never expected that, you know. Um, it was like God was out there, and he did things in the past, but um, the idea of a personal relationship with the Lord, I just, in the way that we understand it, had never heard of that, and that intrigued me. And <clears throat> eventually started going out a little bit to Visitation Academy, but Ed had told me about Dayspring. And uh, so eventually, I, I went there and visited. And uh, I really, I was just really stirred up by that, uh, the warmth of the community at Dave and Ruth's house and the other brothers and sisters that were there. I think in Dayspring is where I first began to learn about having a personal relationship with the Lord. And at that time, I decided to read the whole Bible for myself to find out what it said, and I did uh, get through that. And uh, learning from the Bible, that was the beginning of a lifetime of learning from the Bible. And, uh, and so that, that was a very meaningful time in my life. Also, for me, it was meaningful um, in terms of uh, relationships with the brothers there, because I, I had two brothers, but six sisters. And so, you know, my interactions at home were with my sisters, and I really wasn't close. One brother was quite a bit older than me. And so I really didn't have that. And, and the brothers there were so kind, and uh, there was just easy fellowship with the, the other Christians there. And, uh, and then as far as David and Ruth, um, David was a very gentle, fatherly, kind figure. And uh, I enjoyed his teachings, and I really liked learning about uh, the Bible and, you know, the um, personal teachings about the Bible. And Ruth, uh, I, I, I mostly remember Ruth with a big smile on her face. She smiled a lot and had a gentle chuckle in her voice and, and, and also it just seemed sterling in her commitment to follow the Lord, you know. So they were just great examples. Um, they really set the bar high for following the Lord in a personal way. I don't mean in a demanding way, but just their example uh, really stuck out to me. So it was a whole new understanding for me that, that I was introduced to in, in that fellowship and through Dave and Ruth and, and to following the Lord. It changed my life. I remember being with uh, my friends and worshiping and sharing and traveling and singing and Lots of memories. What was the most unique thing about Dayspring that you remember? Most unique for me? Uh, just the support and the friendship. We just have so many good memories. Oh, I love the music. It was always good. Worship was always good. Lots of grounding. Oh, yeah, I believe that. Very yeah, well rooted. Grounding in the Word. What do you remember most about Dayspring? Well, the, the music was had a style and a class of its own. It was very interesting, timeless. Just a, a family. Everybody was just so full of love and joy and happiness. And that's what I needed at the time. And it really impacted my life. What do I remember? The fellowship, 
and um, the Bible studies. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. And, and at my age, back then, they were seemingly very long Bible studies, and, and, and I think my dad was teaching most of them. <laughs> well, you learned a lot, didn't you? Oh, it was wonderful. Good foundation for the rest of the life. And, and then all of a sudden, when Rick started playing the guitar, the music was heavenly. It was awesome. And then David would teach. And uh, it was wonderful. And uh, we used to go to some of the meetings uh, years ago. And Don Wiggins House. Don Wiggins House. Were, I guess. And, and uh, down, on, down by Washington University. University. As our daughter was uh, a member of Day Spring Group. And so we just went around to see what it was about. And you were at the time, you were a. a Priest at Episcopal priest. Yeah, at, at, Episcopal uh, priest at that time. I remember um, most that there was such a close knit um, fellowship and a love and a caring, and something that we only witnessed really at Grand Falkingham's church down in uh, Houston, Texas, where the, the body was really in unity and harmony, of loving, serving one another. They were living and, uh, in community. Too. Living in community. And that's kind of the idea, I think, with Day Spring. I think that many, many lives were transformed, totally changed uh, as a result of their ministry. Mm -hmm. Amen. And so we just, uh, and David's puns. And then, of course, we had house meetings where, where we rotated Garbars, Haglins, and um, us, and uh, Hatchers. Hatchers. And we prayed, we had dinner, had fellowship, and we prayed fervently for our children. Primarily, yes. <laughs> Every week we met Every at somebody week else's house. we met at somebody house. else's house. So David and Ruth were, uh, in that sense, uh, perfect parents. Now we had, I mean, we had people in, in as Dayspring developed, you know, over time, there were people in different places. and. As scripture says, you know, you have to support the weak brother or sister. And uh, so we had, we had people who, who knew a lot and people who didn't know so much. That was the, the critical element of support which we had in Dayspring. It was a, it was a nearly perfect uh, nurturing environment. And we encouraged one another, those of us who understood, you know, that main lesson that uh, our life is a function of the redemption of Jesus and that we must trust Jesus, period, in all things. Uh, there were those who really understood that and were able to help those who did not yet understand it. I didn't understand it for a long time. At the beginning, I was you know, taken by this uh, teaching or that doctrine and it was a while before I realized uh, what David was teaching, but that was it. Well, I was in seminary at the time and heard about this interesting charismatic group. I wasn't sure about the charismatic movement initially and did a lot of research and checking up on it and was uh, very frustrated. I was satisfied with seminary in terms of the information I was learning, but I was frustrated in terms of my spiritual experience. And so um, I heard about this group, the Hatchers, and. Um, happened to go by the smokehouse early in their development and was very much ministered to as the, the team was up on the stage and Dave Hatcher was there with his bass, which I think he called Grace, and um, Evan Dodd standing there and was seeing Jackie playing the finger cymbals and the tambourine, and it really touched my heart. Uh, eventually, probably about six or eight months later, I, I can't remember how long, I ended up going on a Wednesday evening to worship um, at an apartment across the street from where Jackie lived. Eileen lived there and uh, several other people. And um, I had been singing with a friend of mine in, um, uh, and he and I had been doing coffee houses together and eventually Evan or Emmett and I um, decided to not, not sing together and I got involved with singing with, uh, with Dayspring. I just say, you know, I, I am grateful for Dayspring for so many things in terms of giving me the experience of the presence of the Lord. One of the things that as I, I reflect back on Day Spring was the Wednesday evening meetings. It was fascinating. You, you think of a charismatic community as using spiritual gifts, prophecy and tongues, and, and being rather boisterous. And the, the striking thing about the Day Spring worship on Wednesday evenings was 
Sometimes a half an hour or more would be spent in just quiet in the presence of the Lord, listening to the Holy Spirit. And then after a time of quiet worship, then Dave would do some wonderful teaching out of the, out of the scripture. Uh, over the years, as I became involved in ministry, first with InterVarsity and then as, um, as a campus minister, and then um, as a Presbyterian pastor, I, I became fascinated with spiritual disciplines. Richard Foster had a strong influence on my life. And, and um, I began to uh, emphasize the importance of quiet. And I thought that was something fresh and new that I learned from Foster. And after, I don't know, a number of years, I realized, hey, the reason I took to Richard Foster and the emphasis on silence was because of Dayspring's experience of quiet as a primary means of encountering God. Well, I think I really got that inclination from my experience in Dayspring. We are so grateful for our experience in Dayspring and Absolutely. for all the people who loved us and we love. Very grateful for Dave Hatcher and his and thoughtful Ruth Hatcher. and Ruthie and their yeah. thoughtful, intelligent, and careful teaching. Dave and Ruth Hatcher right here from St. Louis became such anchors of our faith. Dave and Ruth Hatcher were a wonderful group. They spring musical people singing worship songs that we'd never ever heard before and could just, just pour out our hearts and, and our love to this God that we'd finally met. Uh, and and they, they came alongside us. They'd been worshiping and knowing Jesus for years and we just met him. So they were just awesome helps for us as we started this path uh, into the spirit realm. And it seemed like nothing was impossible. Our older son, who at, at one time was very enthusiastic about what was happening and, and uh, especially when 30 people went to Glen Haven, Colorado together for a week and he loved it. In 1972, I except David and Ruth had a dear friend who had a place called Rock Bottom Acres up near Estes Park in Colorado and a place big enough for a, with a house with a dining room and a big living room so we could have fellowship and worship together. And uh, outside the uh, tents could be set up for the guys. And uh, they suggested we think about going there, so we did. We actually drove from St. Louis in a caravan and uh, we got to Colorado and we spent, I think it was, about four or five days, I can't remember now the number, but it was the most amazing opportunity to take a vacation with people that you fellowshiped with in that respect. And it was a wonderful time. A number of people got baptized at that time. Um, and just, the, of course, the scenery you can imagine was, was just incredible. It was near the Big Thompson River, which flowed in the back of the house. There was a bridge out there. You could just stand over there and, and uh, enjoy that atmosphere. So anyway, that was really a remarkable thing, and I was glad we did it. I was actually expecting our first son at the time, so he went along on that trip in his own way, and then he arrived shortly after. When, when we returned, he would look at the house and say, why don't we buy that and all of us live in there? But, you know, he, he missed having parents. And we weren't really parenting. And so he turned. I went to a meeting somewhere in West St. Louis County, where Francis McNutt was speaking. And he told about a certain person whose name I don't remember, 
perhaps didn't even recognize it at the time, but this person had been very much involved in ministry and the Lord had told him to stop what he was doing and devote his time to his family. Oh, hmm, well, that's interesting. So, you know, I, I want to interrupt just by saying I don't know how the Lord got a hold of me. I don't know how He led me, but I, I would seek as best I could to pray, wanting to know His will, and He never spoke to me. But we always ended up, we're looking back, we could see it was exactly where we should be. And so the same is true here, although I did have the strong impression I did not hear a voice, mm -hmm. except in my spirit. Leave the 99 for the one. That's interesting. Talked with Ruth about it. So, <clears throat> went on a conference, uh, or to a conference in Montreat, North Carolina, at the next meeting of Day Spring when we had returned to St. Louis. I uh, stood up and I said, This is what the Lord has said. And Ruth and I left the meeting. I know many people were really hurt that it, it was done so abruptly. And many people who were not even a part of Dayspring were sure I had not heard the Lord correctly. As to the uh, dissolution of Dayspring, I wouldn't call it the end. It really didn't end. It kind of went on in a different form, but um, they, there was a time that uh, we'd been going several years, and there was a time when David came to several of us, sort of leader types, and said that he felt the Lord saying that he was going to um, disassemble, I think was the term he used, disassemble Day Spring. Um, not in any negative sense, but rather the form that that we were in, he was going to take it apart and basically send people out and that uh, Dayspring wouldn't continue to meet at that location in that way, but that it was a, a season of, really a season of preparation. And that's pretty much what happened. So um, as we approach that time and just really before the, the end, David, step down as uh, the leader or pastor, might as well say, um, for, a, for a time I was kind of the, the substitute leader, <clears throat> never comfortable with that at all. Um, but we went on like that for a bit and then it just, uh, you know, people began to, to leave, move, whatever. And um, the Lord did indeed disassemble Dayspring as that, in that form. And um, we all kind of went different places and, and uh, everybody's got their own story for now. So it was not uh, like a shock or surprise. I, I don't really remember anybody being distressed about it. I wasn't. Um, it was a change. You know, we were, there was a sense of anticipation, really. Um, we knew that, you know, something new was coming. It was something the Lord was doing. We were following the Lord. Dayspring, holding Dayspring, you know, together in a certain form was never our goal. Following the Lord Jesus was our goal. And so, uh, you know, we were, I would say, kind of adventurous about it. And uh, we were 
most of us young, uh, college age and so forth, and uh, kind of eager to go on and see what was next. And that was kind of the attitude that uh, I think most of us had. The amazing thing about it, the relationships, uh, the deeply felt affection, um, even today, you know, these are the people I send Christmas cards to. Sometimes I'm not so good at that, but we still have wonderful friendships. And uh, would I think we most of the people that we've seen in the past, maybe 10 years when they've come by or we've been in St. Louis and seen them, it's just picking up where we left off because the Lord is good. And he, uh, but I remember feeling very tired near the end because it was a little bit confusing how everything was going to go. But it, it and actually, it was rather pleasant at the end. Like John said, there was no trauma. Of course, we missed David and Ruth terribly and um, didn't see them as much. Just so grateful for those days. And that, like John said, they did prepare us, but we still have continued affection for those that. We love them, and we all love the Lord together now. So uh, it wasn't a, wasn't a distressing thing. Uh, it wasn't a shock, but it was a good thing, and we just kind of moved on after that, having been well prepared by really superior teaching, as I mentioned before, by David primarily. But we were exposed to you know, many, many teachers, uh, in the St. Louis area, and also, um, you know, tapes. Remember those things, cassette tapes? We had a lot of uh, cassette tape teachings from uh, really good people. And um, so I would say we were, you know, we, we probably thought we were bigger stuff than we really were. And uh, we all had to go through that, learning that we weren't all that cool. Um, but it was uh, it was good a good solid background and uh, as Judy and I have always said uh, it's hard to complain when you start out with the best and uh, and that's uh, really the way it's gone it was it was really a, a superior superior beginning for us about the time that um, day spring uh, was coming to an end uh, we had a, also had a sense that. Uh, that this was, uh, while it was sad, it was uh, a good thing, that the Lord had finished what he was doing among us and actually wanted us uh, out into other uh, new things that he was calling us to. So we had, uh, like my wife Judy says, uh, we had the best, we experienced the best first. And um, we don't have any desire to recreate Day Spring. Uh, there have been those who have wanted to do that sort of thing. Uh, don't really see the need to do that. What we learned was to focus, fix our eyes upon Jesus and to trust him. And uh, that has been the best teaching, the best uh, things that, that we've learned all along. We've been in a number of uh, fellowships and we have had relationships, peripheral relationships with a number of other fellowships along the way, some of which really uh, departed the way and, and went off the rails in rather bizarre ways, actually. Um, and the problem was always that they had their eyes fixed on, on something other than the person of the Lord Jesus himself. So David and Ruth were, were very faithful. Uh, Ruthie was, uh, she opened her home. There was a lot of sacrifice on their part to open their home to so many people who weren't their, you know, direct family. But we were very much a family in Dayspring. And um, so we have uh, not just very fond memories of Dayspring, it was very, very good because of what we learned about uh, and trusting ourselves, surrendering ourselves to the Lord Jesus himself, not to a teaching, not to uh, an experience, but to the person of the Lord Jesus himself. Washington University, after my leave of absence was finished, uh, was in a meeting with just another person and the dean, and the dean said, I'm so happy to see you back. And I responded, well, 
you need to understand that this is not my whole life. I have, I do this to feed my family, but my real life is not here. And he said, well, I'm sorry to hear that. Because I want men whose life is their work. And from that point on, I did not receive any raises. And this was a time of double-digit inflation. And uh, so I knew that I had to, I had to leave. But when I say to you that what was done in Day Spring was entirely God, I, I say that as truth. It is not something for which Ruth and I can claim any credit. I know people try to tell me that no, that's not true, that, etc. But you see, I know. If I functioned as a pastor, it was not because I chose to do that or because I knew how to do that. It was because Jesus, who is the chief shepherd of the sheep, moved through me to do that. The reunion uh, last weekend was, I just see it as a special gift to me because what happened in what we call Day Spring was many years ago. And there was a sense in which I left that work in defeat. I had neglected my older son in giving my attention to so many others. And he became very angry and embittered. And he's 44, 45 years old now, and he's still angry and embittered. The last winter I became very angry at God. I felt safe because I knew that as a natural parent tolerates the anger and the temper tantrums of the natural children, so my father understood my anger and he didn't love me less for it. So, last weekend he brought together people who were able to affirm to me, yes, Jesus really did something very remarkable. What I learned since the experience with Dayspring is that I came out of Dayspring without much humility. And I probably really thought that it was something in me that made that happen. And I, I, I can remember being in situations in which I was really arrogant about how much I knew, including um, when we came to the vineyard in the early 90s. I thought I knew. Now, I know that there's a whole lot 
be known that I have no clue about. Yes, I know the scripture. You know, I, I read it through at least twice a year, starting in Genesis, going through Revelation, and starting over. That's only, that's the only way that, to me, the scripture is coherent. But knowledge of the scripture can only produce more arrogance. I mean, it, it may produce more arrogance. And so, humility is really important. And to realize that apart from the Holy Spirit, I have absolutely nothing to offer. Nothing. And I don't aspire for recognition. I don't aspire for position. I just want nothing. 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 No distraction. No sin that I'm nurturing to hinder my relationship with Jesus. He is everything. Rufus Mosley wrote, He is perfect to everything. Cause of displeasing him is too high. He looks too much. You know, I'm not talking about that which would result in your losing your salvation. I mean, the scripture. Psalm says, The intimacy of the Lord is for those who fear Him. I don't understand what that fear is, but I know that it's much more to it than just being in awe of Him. For me, at this point in my life, it's the fear of losing intimacy with Him. Mm. The thing which Jesus dreaded in Gethsemane was not, in, it's my understanding, it was not the pain. It was the prospect. of losing his unity with the Father. I, I want to be in union with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We may think of the price being too costly, but it's nothing. We still struggle with distractions and with that which Moses gave up, the pleasures of sin for a season. We need to be done with that. Single-minded. More single-minded than the man whose idol is money. Mm. 
and you can't start too young. But you can start too late. There are so many distractions. So many things in which we could indulge in what we consider to be innocent pleasure. Do that which edifies. Do that which edifies. Not that which merely entertains. Mm. You know, I, I'm speaking this to myself as well as anyone else. Mm. Jesus doesn't need anything. No, he didn't need the professor at Washington University. He used that for his own glory. And my hope is that he got glory from it and that he continues to get glory for my life in him, but it's he, not me. Love. Love. Love does not seek its own. patient and kind. Paul said, but I press on. Not that I have already reached maturity, but I press on. Am I mature? Oh, not compared to my Lord. Am I wise? Not compared to my Lord. Ruth loved him. When I met her, she loved him. And it's only by the grace of our Lord that she married me because when we were married, I was an infant. Mm. And uh, she she didn't know that she was doing it, but she nurtured me. And she didn't put up with any nonsense either. Um, the people at Trinity loved her. You know, a husband can get to the place where he doesn't see what other people see. But they loved her. And, and it, it, it was just Jesus in her. She, it, she wasn't doing counseling. She was prophesying. She was loving. It's not just valuable, it's essential. Essential. 
and it isn't our own love. It's His love. Mm -hmm. He wants us to allow His love to flow through us. Distractions. Oh, deadly. Automobile accidents, accidents had people die because of distractions. Mm. People remain immature because they allow distractions to monopolize their life. Martha, you are distracted by many things. But Mary has chosen the better part. Let's come back, comes back to service. Service. Out of what do we serve? Is it obligation? Is it safety? Many years ago, and I, I used that carefully because it implies that I was really wise then. It was Jesus. He, he said that. I didn't hear him. You understand, I'm not talking mm -hmm. about conversations with Jesus. Some people may have them. I don't. Maybe it's because I don't have enough faith for it, but nevertheless, it's not the he way communicates with me. Right, that's not the way he speaks to you. Yeah. It, he, he said, no matter what the man says, It's the spirit in him which is communicated. If these were the last words I would say to you, my beloved grandchildren and sons and daughter, Follow Jesus with your whole heart. Your whole heart, your mind, and your spirit. Don't let your mind be cluttered up with irrelevant knowledge. Don't listen to things which are contrary to the Holy Spirit of God. As a lamb before the slaughter, Jesus bore our griefs and sorrows, yet we did How do you want to be remembered, Dave? As a kind man, as a loving man, that's sufficient.